I wanted to give a talk today on cartilage injuries, uh, in particular, uh, cartilage specific uh, focal cartilage lesions uh, and not uh, diffuse osteoarthritis. Uh, so, uh, as everybody knows, uh, as we get older, um, or even sometimes at a younger age, uh, start cartilage starts to wear out, um, and uh, osteoarthritis has a rather um, formulaic treatment uh, that eventually typically uh, results in joint replacements. However, this is a, a specifically uh, a different uh, entity. Uh, and we're talking about uh, when just one area of cartilage gets injured or damaged, uh, particularly when the rest of the joint uh, looks good and doesn't have any osteoarthritis. So these can be uh, these lesions could be found in younger patients, sometimes even teenagers. Um, and these cartilage lesions can progress and uh, they can be very challenging uh, problem to treat in young patients. So um, what I wanted to uh, talk to uh, today is uh, with regards to uh, how to identify uh, these lesions, um, how do we treat them, what are some of the treatment options we have uh, today, and what are some possible treatment options in the future. Uh, we'll certainly leave some time for uh, questions uh, in the end. Uh, so I have no uh, disclosures, and uh, they had sent out uh, the objectives of this lecture, which I just uh, reviewed. So uh, just to refresh, your articular cartilage is a protective surface that you found in nearly every joint in the body. Um, it has many different functions, but the primary function is to decrease load across the joints um, to protect the underlying bone, um, and also decrease friction so that your uh, joints can move nice and easily, um, or so the bones can move nice and easily uh, against each other. Uh, so it, it has to be uh, very strong in many regards because a lot of the stresses are uh, in all different uh, in all different types of forces. You'll you'll have compressive forces, uh, but also you have shear forces. So it has to be able to withstand um, different vectors of force. Um, what's important to note is that there's, n there's actually no uh, nerve fibers in cartilage. So uh, the pain you actually get from uh, having a cartilage defect uh, is not in the actual cartilage. It's in the bone underneath that sees increased load. It can also be in the uh, synovium around the cartilage and other structures within the knee, but not the actual cartilage. Uh, also uh, important to note that there's absolutely no uh, blood supply um, uh, to the cartilage. So uh, it has very limited healing capacity. It does get nutrients from the surrounding uh, joint fluid, uh, but the fact that it doesn't heal uh, is one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, because once it's injured, uh, it's more or less injured and it's just going to get worse and not uh, ever heal. So um, uh, this is a slide uh, just to, to discuss some of the uh, cartilage, the composition of the cartilage. Uh, these are probably things that you were all hoping to forget about after uh, medical school. But uh, just just to highlight that it's type two collagen that college, that cartilage is made up of. Um, so type one car car collagen is what you'll see in bones and um, many other structures. Uh, but type type two collagen is more resistant to compressive force, which is obviously important for cartilage. And as you can see, the majority of uh, cartilage is actually water and uh, with a small percentage of proteoglycans. So uh, here's just a, a quick histology slide. Um, just to get you an idea, just to give an idea of that, there, this is a very complex structure. Um, they have this has what we call zonal architecture. Um, the specifics of it aren't that important, uh, but as you can see, the uh, closer to the surface, the collagen fibers and the chondrocytes are parallel to the surface, uh, and that helps resist shear forces. Um, and then there's a transitional zone, and then uh, the deep zone. Uh, is also called a radio layer, and you can see that the collagen fibers are actually uh, perpendicular, and so that's more the compressive forces. Um, and then there's what's called the calcified cartilage layer, which is, uh, think of it like the transition uh, to bone, and then underneath is what we call subchondral to bone. Uh, so the, the native uh, cartilage uh, that we're born with is actually a very complex structure, 
um, if you look at the histology. And trying to recreate this is actually one of the biggest challenges of any uh, type of treatment approach. Um, so here's just a close up of some of the histology. So this is an arthroscopic uh, view of, of the knee. So I, I do a lot of uh, knee arthroscopies as a sports surgeon. And if you look at on the left, uh, this would be the view of um, a young person without any problem. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, medial, this is the medial compartment, and on the top of the screen, uh, you'll see the medial femoral condyle. On the bottom, you'll see the medial tibial plateau, and you'll see the meniscus in between. So this is this white shiny uh, surface is what a uh, perfectly healthy cartilage should look like. And so then, if you look to the right, this is actually uh, a 21 year old patient. Um, and that's their trochlea, and uh, this is what can happen. So uh, as you can see, it's not a nice smooth surface. Uh, it's starting to peel off. Uh, that's my metal probe showing that there is a flap there at the edge, um, not quite down to bone. So you can't see bone yet, but uh, I'm willing to, this appears to be at least 50% of a defect. Uh, so that's what unhealthy cartilage can look like. So as I discussed in the opening, uh, there's a distinct difference between uh, osteoarthritis and a very focal uh, cartilage lesion. Um, so they're very distinct, distinctively different entities, although there might be some overlap. Uh, certainly uh, having a cartilage injury can, uh, can affect the cartilage that it's articulating with and actually cause uh, some focal uh, post-traumatic arthritis. Also, osteoarthritis, think of as a, a, a global kind of disease of the, of the knee. Uh, you'll start to get changes in the joint fluid. Uh, you'll get synovitis. Uh, you'll start get just gradual breakdown of the cartilage elsewhere. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, the image on the left, that's an arthroscopic image of, arth of osteoarthritis. So um, obviously, if you try to fix just one area of that osteoarthritis, it's very, very unlikely that they're actually going to get better. Um, I like to use the analogy that you have a forest fire and you're just putting out a couple trees in the middle of it. So um, uh, obviously that's not really going to stop anything. Uh, neither is these uh, some of the uh, more advanced uh, complex uh, procedures we'll talk about um, later on in the talk. Um, this is an example of a focal cartilage lesion. So as you can see, you can actually see the bone there. Um, this is actually a, a college football player after an injury. Uh, and But you can see the, the surrounding cartilage is that nice, healthy, um, thick, white cartilage. So uh, think of it, I, I tell patients, it's kind of like having a pothole in an otherwise well-paved uh, street. So this is where we can help make a difference potentially uh, by trying to fill in that pothole um, and uh, try to recreate the best we can uh, some of the normal function of cartilage. So uh, these cartilage lesions can be full thickness or partial thickness. That image I, show, I showed a couple slides ago was a partial thickness cartilage defect, uh, which means it's not down to bone. But in this case, as you can see, uh, you, you're staring at subchondral bone. So that's what we, that's what's considered a full thickness defect. So again, these are the, these are the differences, and we're going to be focusing on the uh, cartilage lesions today. So first of all, these cartilage lesions are very common. Uh, we see them all the time, and uh, we see them in all ages. You can get cartilage uh, osteochondral injuries uh, for kids. They're called OCD lesions. Uh, you can see them in high school kids. Uh, see, we see them a lot in college athletes, um, and then in the 20s and 30s. And um, I know I keep talking about quote unquote younger patients, Oh, uh, in general, for the health of the age of the knee, we consider 40 and younger young. Um, however, uh, certainly uh, everybody's knee ages at a different age, uh, at a different rate. Uh, there, there are some 50-year-olds that are still running marathons, and you stick the scope in there, and their knee looks like a 20-year-old. So uh, when we talk about treating these cartilage lesions, what's most important is the physiologic age of the knee. Do they have any arthritis? Uh, is there a good, healthy cartilage thickness there? Um, so if they're an older patient, but they have a knee that uh, is re relatively healthy and have an isolated lesion, uh, we would treat those on the same pathway. So
So um, you can get them after a traumatic event. Uh, you dislocate your patella, you fall on the knee, you get hit there. Um, uh, so there, there could be any number of, of potential traumatic injuries that will just knock off a piece of cartilage. So that, that would be the case, you'd have two problems. Not only would you be missing cartilage in that area, but now you have a big piece of cartilage floating around in your knee that needs to be addressed. Um, but oftentimes there's not a specific injury like that. It's just a more gradual, um, a more gradual pain and swelling that the patient gets. And we get an image and there's no loose body. It's just uh, one specific area gradually wore out for one reason or another. So uh, you, there are some predisposing factors. A ligament instability certainly can put some more stress on certain parts of uh, of the knee, as in particular the cartilage. Um, if you're missing meniscus from a certain area, that's going to cause more load, um, to increase force because it doesn't have the protection of the meniscus, and so that can wear out the cartilage quicker. If you have any malalignment, uh, if you have a varus or valgus knee, uh, or the, the 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 lay terms would be knock kneed or bow legged, that will certainly put uh, uh, increased stress is on certain parts of, of the knee. So if there's any cartilage that's having an increased stress uh, for any of these reasons, uh, you can get a uh, cartilage lesion. The most important thing is that the symptoms are really variable. Uh, often, as we talked about earlier in the talk, uh, the cartilage in itself doesn't have any nerve fibers. So um, it, it just because you're missing a little cartilage, uh, oftentimes, we'll just find those on MRIs or uh, arthroscopies, and they've been completely asymptomatic for patients. Um, and I've seen smaller cartilage lesions that have been very debilitating, and I've seen larger ones that ha really aren't bothering people at all. Uh, so, and it, it seems to really not uh, correlate with size. Uh, some of them can progress. I mean, I, I guess in, in reality, all of them will eventually progress if you uh, live long enough. But some of them progress really quickly and others uh, seemingly uh, reach, reach a steady state and they, they, they can go, patients can go decades without having any worsening of, of symptoms. Um, it's really hard to predict that. Uh, however, if, if you have any of those predisposing factors like ligament instability, malalignment or meniscal deficiency, uh, predictably, the patients will get worse sooner because of that overload in that area. So as for the history, like I mentioned, it's, it's extremely variable. Sometimes they'll have a his, uh, history of an injury. But most importantly, uh, cartilage lesions tend to cause swelling and effusion. So for me, when I see a patient, a young patient with uh, swelling, uh, first of all, in someone without arthritis, that's never normal, uh, a true effusion of the knee. Um, but I always think more cartilage uh, because um, meniscus, if you have a chronic meniscus tear, that's typically unlikely to cause the type of swelling uh, that you see with cartilage. Uh, you tend to see it more with activity and especially higher impact activities. So if, uh, if they have more pain and swelling when they're running or jumping or weightlifting or playing sports, uh, but it improves with rest, um, uh, particularly if swelling is involved. Uh, that's that's the typical story uh, that you'll get with a cartilage uh, defect. And uh, when I say cartilage lesions or cartilage defects, that's more they are more or less um, uh, the, the the same thing. Uh, so those are both terms that we'll commonly use. Um, so uh, we'll also use the term osteochondral defect um, if it not only involves the cartilage but also if there's a cyst or uh, some injury to the bone underneath. Uh, so that, that's sometimes what you'll see as well. Um, what's also important to note is sometimes you'll have catching. Some, a patient will feel like something's clicking or catching. Um, and that's if at the edge of the cartilage lesion, if there's a flap, uh, like a flap tear of the cartilage, uh, that can, as you bend and extend the knee, uh, that, that flap can get caught, almost like having a hangnail that gets caught. And uh, that, that it can also cause uh, some mechanical symptoms like that. And oftentimes just uh, cleaning up the flap and making sure that there's no unstable cartilage edges is all that needs to be done. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, and the physical examination can really be variable. Um, and uh, I mean, if you might, I would definitely look to see if there's an effusion. 
uh, they might have tenderness over that specific area. And that can be very, very helpful. So as I mentioned, it's very common to get uh, to see uh, have incidental findings of just finding a, a cartilage defect that doesn't seem to correlate with, with where they're having pain. And what I mean is if somebody is saying that they have a lot of pain under the kneecap, but they're, but you get an MRI and their cartilage lesion is in the back of the knee, like on the femoral condyle, uh, and they're not having any tenderness there, then it probably means that that's not what's really causing their pain. Uh, so it's really, uh, the history and physical examination is very important for us to really de determine whether it's this cartilage lesion causing pain or if it's something else like patellofemoral syndrome or meniscus tear. Uh, so it has to really make sense and also be in the same location. But uh, oftentimes they will have tenderness right over where they're having that cartilage defect or in that general area. Uh, so the we always start with non-operative treatments. So just because it's a young patient with a uh, cartilage injury, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to do anything. Now, if, they're, if they had knocked off a piece of cartilage that's floating around like a loose body, sure, that, that would be something we'd want to get after. But um, just the fact that, they're missed, that they have a, a cartilage lesion does not necessarily mean that they're going to need surgery. Um, all, the, all of the treatments I'm going to talk about uh, to, to fill in that cartilage, none of them have actually proven to prevent the progression of arthritis. Now, there's some thought that if you successfully do this, that it will, uh, but it's very hard to study and really hasn't been convincingly shown in the literature. So the indications for surgery is really pain, pain relief. So if we can relieve their pain and symptoms with non-operative treatments, we could potentially save them uh, from uh, having to have a surgery um, and also a long rehab involved. Uh, so the, the inflammation and the swelling from, uh, from these that are caused uh, by these lesions uh, typically cause the most pain so, and symptoms. So uh, anti-inflammatories um, and really getting that swelling down is one of the best things you can do. Uh, so we'll usually start with some ibuprofen or naproxen or whatever your favorite NSAID is. Uh, tell them to elevate ice. Um, and then all of the, the, the other things that we can do to decrease load on the knee, such as weight loss, um, uh, really strengthening the muscles around uh, the, the lower extremity, including the hip and the core. Um, having, having, having good strength can help take pressure off the knee. Um, it can help the biomechanics. So that certainly is helpful. And they can, and physical therapy can uh, be helpful for that as well. Uh, sometimes we'll use a brace as, uh, as well. So if all of their pain is in the uh, medial side of their knee, uh, potentially we can do a medial unloading brace to take some pressure specifically off that uh, defect. Um, so these are all things that are worth trying. Um, typically, I would give at least a six or eight week uh, course of it. Um, before uh, trying any uh, type of surgery. Uh, injections are helpful as well. Now, I, my personal philosophy for, uh, for patients that don't have arthritis and it's just a defect, I really try to avoid uh, corticosteroids. Now, there, there is some research out there suggestive that uh, corticosteroids, particularly re repeated injections, uh, can cause accelerated arthritis and cartilage wear. Um, I think uh, the jury is still out on that. And if the patient is really suffering from osteoarthritis, particularly advanced osteoarthritis, uh, uh, and we're just trying to control pain, I think the cat's out of the bag a little bit at that point. So I, I, that, that, those are cases where I would do steroid. But if it's a, an 18-year-old that's having some uh, knee pain and swelling as a result of a cartilage defect, uh, corticosteroid really is not my uh, go-to because it's. Um, I think there could it could cause some damage, um, and uh, is unlikely to really fix the problem. Um, however, uh, the two injections that I will do in this situation are hyaluronic acid injections and PRP. So hyaluronic ac uh, acid injections, um, otherwise known as gel or lubricant uh, injections, and some of the brand names will be Synvisc, Hyalgen. Um, just to name a few, and um, I'm, I'm not supporting any of those uh, brand names, but uh, sometimes people will call it Synvisc. Uh, but the hyaluronic acid injections, I have personally found to be very helpful uh, for young patients with uh, cartilage uh, injuries. 
Um, some uh, oftentimes will help it will help an athlete get through the season. Um, and I would say anecdot- anecdotally, uh, in the, in that situation, it has been helpful at least uh, to get them a, to give them a, couple, a few months of uh, pain relief and um, allow them to uh, rehab. Uh, platelet-rich plasma. Uh, I mean, that's that's a whole another uh, talk on itself. In itself, uh, some of you may have heard about that. It's considered a biological type of injection where uh, we. Uh, in the office, uh, we will do a peripheral blood draw, uh, typically just 15 or 20 cc's. Uh, there's a special centrifuge that we put the uh, blood in, and it separates out uh, the different layers, and uh, we will uh, take just the plasma and the platelets. Um, and there's a lot, there There are many, and there are thousands of growth factors there. Um, and no, uh, to be honest, nobody's sure exactly how it works, uh, but it, it tends to uh, restart um, a healing process and if you inject into soft tissues, uh, but it can have a lot, it can really help with inflammation in, in the knee. Um, I, I am not saying that, uh, to be clear, I'm not saying that it regrowth cartilage or anything like that, and no one has ever proven that, uh, but it, it can help with the pain and the swelling. Uh, and I have found that to be helpful as well in this uh, population, although the downside to that treatment is it is uh, out of pocket expense. Um, so but I, I found that both of those type of injections can be helpful in helping an athlete, uh, particular, I've done it more often in college athletes, uh, to help them get through a season, and especially if they're planning on a surgery at the end of the season. So the big question is, what if, what if none of that works? What if they're still having um, problems from this defect? What if the, the rest of their knee looks great on MRI, but they have a one centimeter area where the cartilage is damaged and they're 22 years old and they have a, they can't even run or work out. So um, that's when we start. To, once they fail the non-operative treatments, that's when we start talking to them about some of the surgeries uh, that we can do. So really, the indications are if you have a, a symptomatic defect. Again, like we talked about earlier, just really everything should make sense. So uh, the the defect should be where they're having pain. Like if it's uh, like I said before, if all their pain is at the patella, but their defect is in the posterior uh, knee, then that's not a great indication. Um, if they have uh, cartilage flaps, and you can definitely see those on MRI uh, or loose bodies, uh, uh, those tend to be particularly sim- uh, cause a particular um, sim- uh make them particularly symptomatic. Uh, so in those cases, I'll be a little bit more aggressive recommending surgery. Um, although I said the size doesn't necessarily uh, correlate with symptoms, uh, it does have some type of a, fact, uh, of a, of a factor on what we do, uh, surgically speaking, because some, some of the options will be uh, more ideal for smaller lesions and, and some uh, in, that you won't be able to do for the larger lesions. Um, and then there are there's the, there are a lot of um, there's a large gray area. Let me put it that way uh, for uh, relative contraindications. Um, some of those would be malalignment, instability, not having enough meniscus in that area, uh, with the thought that let, let's say you have a pretty big cartilage defect of the medial femoral condyle. And it's caused because you're missing all your meniscus there and you have an ACL tear. Well, going in there and just taking care of that cartilage defect is very, very unlikely to be successful because it's still going to have too much uh, force because you don't have uh, meniscus. So oftentimes in those cases, though, we can uh, we can do an ACL reconstruction. Uh, we can do a meniscus transplant and do, take care of the cars at the same time. So it's, it's oftentimes you can uh, address some of the other factors, but you can't just look at the cartilage by itself. You need to look at the whole knee. Um, a, a contraindication would also be osteoarthritis. Now, of course, there is a gray area there if it's a younger patient with maybe some, you know, early arthritis, but like one or two areas that are really big. Um, you know, that, we still may address that. Another would be bipolar lesions, and that where is where, let's say, the femoral condyle and the patel and the uh, tibial plateau, where they articulate. If if uh, if both sides uh, are down to bone, 
um, th those tend to, and they're rubbing up against each other. Those, those tend to be less successful with all of these um, treatments. And then ha having a high BMI um, obviously puts more stress on that, uh, any kind of repair that you do that's more likely to fail. And also uh, these uh, restoration, we could say cartilage restoration is a term we use for trying to regrow or transfer or heal cartilage. Um, uh, they, they require really protecting it for a while. And if it's someone that is just not going to be compliant or is unwilling to be non-weight bearing afterwards, then it's really not even worth doing um, because it's just not going to be successful. And I, I put it quite, smoking obviously can uh, affect the healing uh, of any part of the body, but uh, and including the knee. And age is a relative um, contraindication. Uh, historically, uh, you know, decades ago, uh, the, some of these advanced cartilage surgeries were only done uh, for patients under the age of 40. But since then, some research has come out uh, for having basically equal results for younger patients and, uh, and carefully selected patients over the age of 40. So for most of us, age isn't really a contraindication. Uh, it's just more uh, physiologically of what that knee looks like. Uh, have you already started to go through uh, osteoarthritic changes or not? So um, some of the surgical options, which I'll discuss in uh, some deeper, uh, more detail. Uh, one is just a simple debridement or chondroplasty. Uh, one is a marrow stimulation, otherwise known as microfracture, which I'm sure everyone's heard about. Um, osteochondral autograft transfer, otherwise known as an OATS, where you take some cartilage from one area of the knee and move it to uh, a damaged area. Um, and then a version of that would be as if we use cadaver tissue, uh, if, the, if the damage area is too big, uh, we can use um, an osteochondral allograft. Um, uh, autologous plant implant, uh, chondrocyte implantation is where we take some of the cartilage out, we send it to a lab, grow it out, grow normal cartilage out from your own chondrocytes, and then uh, have a second surgery to implant it. Um, and then there's a couple others uh, that, that I will uh, discuss as well. Now, uh, I've been talking about the knee, and in fact, most of the research uh, that's been out there is for these cartilage defects in the knee, and it's by far the most common. Uh, but I want to, but these, these principles can be to apply to any joint in the body. Uh, they are doing a lot of uh, these type of surger uh, surgeries in the hip and ankle as well. Um, less commonly in the upper extremity, just because it's not weight bearing. Uh, but certainly I've, I've, we've done microfractures in shoulders um, and it's been um, these principles uh, can be used elsewhere. Um, so the decision making process about which one of these surgeries to do um, uh, is, is, is complex, and if you t uh, talk to 100 different orthopedic surgeons, you might get 100 different answers. But there are some general trends um, and con uh, a consensus among some of these uh, different treatment options that, that I'll discuss. Um, I think the biggest decision uh, is deciding first whether to do surgery or not. And I think we've, uh, as we've outlined earlier, but once you've decided that you're gonna do surgery, then I talked to them, a patient about, are we just going to clean this up and do a chondroplasty or are we going to do a bigger surgery to try to regrow the cartilage? Um, and then from there, uh, it depends on where it is in the knee, uh, what kind of activity demands a patient has, how big is the defect? Is it six millimeters by six millimeters or is it 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters? Those are very different. Uh, those are very different types of defects with different kinds of treatments involved. And also a surgeon preference. Obviously, you need to be uh, comfortable with whatever, any of these options uh, for it to be successful because some of them are quite uh, technically demanding. Um, I understand that uh, I don't think anybody uh, on this call is a surgeon, uh, but I think a lot of you may have uh, uh, had some interest in, in this or have heard of some of these um, surgeries that are done. So I just wanted to give a, couple, uh, a brief overview and also uh, some, uh, some pictures just to show you uh, what these surgeries are and how we do it. Um, and it might help uh, explain to patients as well. So uh, as an over, overall, the, the cartilage restoration tends to work pretty well. Um, it's very, very challenging to do research on this for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's not that common of a procedure. Secondly, 
um, almost, it's hard to find two cartilage lesions that are exactly alike. Um, they might be in different parts of the knee. It's, you can't really compare a directly compare a, a lesion in the trochlea or the patella to one of the uh, femoral condyle. They all have different sizes. Uh, the patients uh, have different demands. Uh, some patients might have be missing meniscus, some may not. Uh, so there's just so many factors that it's very uh, uh, challenging to uh, to follow. And, and also, uh, uh, we have a really robust uh, animal studies uh, that are re re robust results in animal studies, mainly because uh, we can actually do second surgeries or biopsies of the cartilage and look at that afterwards. And obviously, uh, for, uh, you know, there are some studies in Asia uh, back in the 90s, or I think 2000s, where they would do second look arthroscopies and just take a small biopsy. Um, but that that's not kind of done in the United States. And it, it's, you know, obvious for obvious reasons, um, uh, th that's not commonly done. Despite all of that, about 70% of patients are pretty, uh, have had significant improvements and are very happy with the results. And, and, and they, they, the results tend to last for 10 years or longer, although the um, relative improvement tends to deteriorate with time for many of these techniques. But um, usually there's no right answer and that uh, there's typically, for a given defect, there could be a couple options. Um, and there are pros and cons to each option, what we'll talk about. Uh, overall, uh, these kind of treatments in the patellofemoral joint, that's the, the kneecap and its groove, uh, tends to not work as well. And that's probably because there's uh, a lot more shear forces uh, with that, um, uh, with the knee inflection and extension. And there's also a tremendous amount of load on, uh, on, on that area. Uh, in fact, uh, the patella has the thickest cartilage of anywhere in the body, just because uh, that's the, the it has to from the amount of forces uh, that are involved. So again, this is just the same picture that I uh, showed earlier. Of uh, so on the left is a nice young uh, hyaline uh, native cartilage that's not damaged, and on the right uh, is damaged cartilage. So um, we're not able to. So in an ideal world, we'd be able to completely uh, recreate uh, what we have on the left. Now, a chondroplasty is uh, is another way of saying we're just going to clean up that uh, that that uh, cartilage uh, lesion. So just having a flap in itself can be symptomatic. So I'll use that same analogy I had I have of like a of a hangnail. So, you know, it can catch on your clothes if you, it, and it can tear and get bigger and it can just it cause some problems. So often if you just take out a nail clipper and trim that off and smooth it out, uh, the rest of the nail, uh, that usually solves the problem. And um, just like a hangnail, we can't get this to heal. Uh, so really just trimming it out and smoothing it out um, is how you treat it. And uh, so if you look at the bottom left here, uh, that's an example of a femoral condyle cartilage uh, flap. Uh, it's a partial thickness, so it didn't go down to bone. Um, and then uh, after I cleaned it out, we, we'll do that with a combination of a biter or a shaver. Um, and you see on the on the right-hand side, uh, this is a pretty small lesion, probably about five millimeters, but uh, no longer has that flap. And that patient actually did very well, and that's all they needed. And even for the bigger lesions, uh, this patient, um, the one on the right, was actually a, a medical student that I treated years ago. Um, and he, you know, he was 21 years old and had uh, this, this very diffuse uh, cartilage uh, damage throughout the trochlea. Um, and a lot, a, lot of, a, a lot of you may ask, why? Why did he get that? And I have the same question. Uh, he was just, he didn't play any, you know, college sports. He plays occasional, you know, pick up basketball. But there, there's definitely a lot of research coming out about cartilage genetics. Some people just tend to have hardier cartilage. And uh, I will admit, I don't know why, but there are, I've definitely seen 50 year olds that run five marathons a year that have perfect cartilage where other patients like this or even younger have their cartilage just seeming to, to fall off uh, for lack of a better term. And I, I definitely think uh, genetics uh, plays a factor. But uh, so this, this patient to the left, as big as that defect is, we decided as a first surgery just to, 
to clean it up, uh, do a chondroplasty. And he, it's been years and he actually is completely pain free. So that's all we needed to do for him. Uh, so it, first of all, the, the advantages are it's an, it's a very quick and easy surgery. Um, it typically takes 20 minutes or so. It's a very easy rehab. I let them put weight on it right away. Typically it's a four to six week full recovery to get back to all activities. Uh, it's inexpensive. Uh, it's, uh, you can do it at a surgery center. So uh, it, it, there's a lot of um, attractive features of this type of surgery. Now, you're still going to have uh, missing cartilage there. We're not attempting to regrow cartilage at all. But we're trying to just see, hey, if we clean it up, get rid of that flap, is that going to take care of the problem? Oftentimes it does. Uh, there was actually um, one of the more prominent uh, cartilage surgeons in the country uh, presented uh, his uh, research at a, at a meeting a couple of years ago showing that, uh, you know, of all these big cartilage defects where he, you know, first step would be to clean it out. And then they would say, all right, well, if you're having pain in the future, come back and we'll do the big surgery. Well, only 50 percent of the patients ended up needing another surgery. So this can certainly work a good percentage of the time. Um and uh, but what if it doesn't work, you know, or uh, th there are some patients that just want uh, a, a, want to have a more definitive surgery. And the goal of some of these surgeries is to try to regrow cartilage, try to move cartilage around or try to fill in that gap to give some protection um, and to actually treat the problem. Um, well, uh, one of the most common that's been a uh, common treatments that's been uh, performed throughout the country over the past, uh, or probably, sorry, throughout the world over the past uh, couple decades uh, would be bone marrow stimulation, um, otherwise known as microfracture or drilling. So I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of microfracture. And what that is, is if uh, is we were going to clean out uh, any kind of peach fuzz or a little bit, whatever cartilage is left, get down to bone, make sure that the edges um, uh, are nice and clean so that you really have a clean quote unquote pothole. And then we uh, use a mallet and awls to create a couple holes or small channels to the center of the bone. Now, why do we do that? Well, the access is the bone marrow. The bone marrow is actually very rich of uh, healing factors. There's bone marrow derived stem cells, which can turn it, which can differentiate into cartilage. So the theory is that you uh, make these holes and that it, you know, the everything, and then here I have a depiction here. We're gonna clean everything up, clean out the calcified cartilage layer, which is that last layer to get down to subchondral bone. We're gonna use a pick here that you can see at the bottom left corner uh, to get down to the bone marrow. And we make really pretty small holes and we separate them out. And then um, if everything goes well, it's gonna, it's gonna, first of all, that pothole is gonna, I keep saying pothole, I'm sorry, that's what I, that's how I describe it to patients. Uh, that but that, that uh, cartilage defect is gonna fill uh, with the bone marrow contents and there's gonna be uh, many regenerative factors, including stem cells in there. That's gonna form a clot. And then over time, the hope is that it differentiates into cartilage. So, um, you can do this with either a micro, the traditional microfractures you use in all like this, uh, but more recently uh, we've been using drills. The thought is that the microfracture kind of compacts the bone edge and kind of it almost looks like the edge of a crater where you have a little area of raised bone um, on the sides of it. So a drill can help just make a cleaner channel, but um, uh, no one's really proven that one is better than the other. Um, either way, uh, it is a pretty tough rehabilitation afterwards. Um, we are trying to get these stem cells to turn into to turn on that switch to become cartilage and not bone. So it's actually the the thought is that you want to move that knee as much as possible, uh, so that uh, the knee knows, so that the those cells know that it's a joint. But you also don't. I mean, this is just going to be a blood clot more or less at first. So you don't wanna be putting too much weight on it uh, or any stress. So really for six to eight weeks, it's uh, moving the knee as much as you can and keeping your weight off of it. And that's really important. 
Uh, these uh, continuous passive motion devices, otherwise known as CPMs, uh, you can see that in the bottom left corner here, uh, that will actually move the knee for you. And the recommendation, the traditional recommendation would be to wear those for about six to eight hours at a time. Um, and the thought is that that can uh, stimulate chondrogenic differentiation. But this is a very slow healing process. To get that uh, blood clot to turn into cartilage, that can take up to that can take years and at the very minimum six months uh, to a year till we let patients start running and doing certain uh, higher impact activities now um as you can imagine uh that's a much different uh, rehab than just the chondroplasty that we mentioned so that's that's why one of the reasons the chondroplasty as a first line treatment is often uh, an attractive option for patients especially when it works about 50 percent of the time as i mentioned um, but this certainly can can be uh, helpful. So advantages, uh, it's easy to do. All you need is that mallet or drill. So if you're doing an arthroscopy and it's a, maybe a bigger lesion or a deeper lesion than you think, uh, you can always just uh, easily just do that. And it takes about five, 10 minutes. Um, it's inexpensive. Uh, you don't have to put in any implants. So uh, it's a very inexpensive type of treatment. And it's relatively speaking, it's fairly straightforward. And even people that don't specialize in sports medicine um, that have just done an orthopedic surgery residency can do it. Um, of course, technique, proper technique is important, but uh, those are some, but uh, not very difficult. Some advantages, disadvantages are overall the uh, uh, outcomes are very good, especially the first two years, but the results and outcomes uh, tend to deteriorate after two years. Uh, it's still better than what you were before surgery, uh, but they they do uh, go down. Um, the results are tip are also not as good for bigger lesions. You know, the initial descriptions before we had other options was up to four centimeters square defect. Now that that's a very large uh, defect, four centimeters square. That's the majority of the weight bearing surface. So um, I don't think uh, there's hardly anyone that would really do a microfracture at that size anymore. In general, we try to keep it less than two centimeters squared, but in all reality, uh, I think anything greater than 1.5 centimeters squared or so, uh, you're really probably better off doing some of the other um, uh, uh, other cartilage restorations uh, procedures. So the next one I'd like to talk about, which also has a longer track record, is uh, Osteochondral autograft transfer. I know that's a mouthful. Uh, we, we call it OATS. Uh, that's what the technique uh, uh, got. That's what the, the set that we use is called, but uh, that's what it's also been uh, known to be referred as. And um, what it is, uh, quite simply, is we take a piece of cartilage connected to the bone. We basically take a hollow core uh, cylinder and we core it out from a, a part of the knee where you don't really put much weight on. And then we move that entire unit to the damaged area, so to the cartilage defect. So we're based, So if you look at the right um, of our screen, you'll see the side view of uh, that is going to be our, what we call the donor plug. So we've taken this unit out. And the benefit is we have, this is the basically the only the only uh, treatment we have, we are using completely normal cartilage from that own patient. So that's going to have that perfect histology that we found. It's going to be uh, have a perfect connection to bone. It has nice, healthy bone. And we know bone heal, even though cartilage doesn't heal, bone likes to heal, as we know. So bone will heal the bone. So um, if well, and then we're going to move that to an area uh that is uh, concerning, that, that's a more important part of the knee uh, versus basically a weight-bearing aspect. And I'm going to come back to the slide in a sec, but we show you here, um, uh, this is from uh, the uh, Arthrex website. Uh, this is the set that's commonly used. Uh, again, I'm not endorsing any, um, any brand names at all. Uh, but this, uh, if you look at the, uh, the up, the uh, left part of the knee here, uh, those holes there, that, th those are areas where you don't really put any weight on. So when you're putting standing, you're not putting any weight in that area, and it's more or less too, too far to the lateral side of the knee for the uh, patella to put weight on. Uh, so that, that's an ideal place to take it. Now, and 
you can put multiple plugs into a bigger lesion, as you see here, and that's called mosaic plasty. But in general, that's not really performed much anymore. Um, but as you can see, the big the big downside is uh, there's a limit. There, there's not your knees uh, weren't created with a lot of extra cartilage um, areas that aren't important. So you're kind of limited on size to about one centimeter. Um, and that's really the maximum size. You can't take a couple plugs, but if it's a really big defect, you're not going to be able to have enough to take. Um, but this is just a, an exa uh, a, a patient ex a case example of uh, so bottom left. Uh, that is the uh, cartilage defect uh, after we took, we cored out uh, the bone and the cartilage. And to the right is after we've transplanted cartilage. So as you can see, uh, that that more or less looks like a, a normal a cartilage right there. So uh, this is one of my favorite cartilage procedures. Overall, it has excellent results. And this is the one uh, area where we, we do have some good research, where they did a randomized uh, uh, study where comparing oats to microfracture, and it had uh, pr pretty significantly better results, um, um, better uh, results with regards to pain and getting back to sport compared to microfracture. It also heals quicker. We don't have to uh, slow them down as long, um, and we can get them back to running uh, quicker. So this is certainly an attractive option in the right patient. Um, uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're uh, you know, you're, uh, I think I talked about all of these advantages, um, but uh, you can have some pain from the where you took it, uh, the donor site. It's actually not that common. People do pretty well. I don't really typically complain of pain there, pain there, but they can. And really the size is a, a, a big limitation. Now, if you have a really big area like this, uh, then it's too big and uh, you have to use an osteochondral allograft. And that's where we take a cadaver knee and to basically do the same process. Uh, we have to send an MRI so they can match the size, um, but we do take, it, it is a fresh frozen um, cadaver bone with live chondrocytes. So the downside is you only have about two weeks to get it in the knee. That can be logistically challenging, but here's an example. Um, as you can see, a huge lesion. This is most of that you just don't have enough of your own to take, uh, but uh, you can get a si similar type of um, outcome if you use uh, the cadaver tissue. Uh, the big disadvantage is it's very expensive. Uh, you might be waiting for months, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call, hey, you need a surgery uh, for two, with a long rehab for two, in two weeks. So uh, that's a downside. Uh, so the, all, all of those that I just mentioned are the by far the most common uh, that are done now. That probably represents about 80 90% of the cartilage uh, surgeries that are done out there. Uh, so some of, the, some of the, the, the hot new things out on the market um, uh, I'll go over, but I'll, but they have very limited data. So one is particulated at juvenile articular cartilage, and that's where uh, you you it, it comes from a, a juvenile donor with the thought that there is more healing potential and higher concentration of chondrocytes. Um, and basically, it's minced up, chopped up um, cartilage that you glue into the um, into the defect. So uh, the, down, the downside is it only has a two week shelf life. So if you end up not using it, uh, it's very, it can be a big cost to the hospital. It's very expensive. You need to order it ahead of time. So you can't just decide to do that when you're in the OR. And there's really limited data uh, to support it. Um, another implant that uh, uh, I, I've used is a, a, a mesh cryopreserved articular cartilage. So instead of having to order um, a cadaver knee, uh, this is a, a cryopreserved mesh, uh, but it, it does have uh, chondrocytes and it is uh, articular cartilage. Um, so you uh, it has a, a, a two-year shelf life um, and you can implant that. And usually we'll do that in addition to like a microfracture. And sorry, I'm getting a little so on, late on time. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to try to go quickly through this uh, last section. Um, and then ACI, this is not commonly done as much anymore, uh, but used to be uh, very popular. Um, it's where you grow out cartilage into a sheet. So what you would do is two surgeries. The first surgery, surgery, you're in there, you might do a chondroplasty, and you take out a little piece of cartilage from an unimportant area. It goes to the lab, they grow out your chondrocytes, so you basically uh, will be able to inject um, uh, chondrocytes, and those are the cells that cartilage are made out of. Um, the big, the big downside is it's not, uh, normal, um, 
you're not going to have that normal zonal architecture of cartilage. It's just, uh, it's going to be disorganized. Uh, this is how you would do it. You would put on a membrane, you would sew it on, and then you can see here is in a syringe, you would inject uh, the chondrocytes. And nowadays they have something called Matrix or Macy, um, which uh, basically comes already, uh, uh, the, the cells are already in a scaffold that you just uh, suture on. Um, so it's, the problem is this is very expensive. Uh, it's, um, it's very expensive. It is uh, two different surgeries. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, and uh, it hasn't been shown to be any better than the other, uh, any of the other treatments. So the final section, uh, cartilage tissue engineering. Uh, this is just to show, I mean, I just Googled this yesterday, not Googled, PubMed did yesterday, 15,000 results. So this is an extremely hot topic. Being able to regrow cartilage is kind of the holy grail of uh, orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. So uh, current, lots of current cartilage research and uh, especially using uh, stem cells because because they can turn into cartilage. So you can get that for, through adipose-derived, uh, the adipose-derived stem cells that you find in fat can actually turn into cartilage, bone marrow derived. There's a lot of promising animal studies, um, uh, but the problem is in the United States, the FDA doesn't uh, really limit what, how we can uh, manipulate and use these stem cells. So uh, in other parts of the world, particularly Asia, uh, they're much more advanced than we are. Uh, and then tissue engineering is really gonna be the future here uh, to be able to uh, regrow the different zones and uh, the specific, uh, try to recreate that uh, hyaline cartilage. 3D printing is also a very exciting uh, new direction. Um, so the uh, implant must be stable, cost-effective, safe, um, and uh, be able to clear the FDA restrictions. I just wanted to show uh, uh, some of the research I've done with uh, John Fisher, who is a, the chair of bioengineering at College Park. Um, and he's been 3D, uh, he's been 3D printing some of these uh, scaffolds. And uh, he's figured out a way to attach certain uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, molecules uh, to the, the scaffold that can uh, improve Hello. healing and uh, cause it to uh, turn into more of a, a normal uh, cartilage uh, structure. So uh, the study we did was using aggregin because uh, it's a main proteoglycan, uh, proteoglycan component of native cartilage. Uh, we did surgery on uh, 14 rabbits, uh, tested microfracture with and without this biofunctionalized uh, cartilage. As you see here, uh, on the on the right hand side, it will be, it re results in much thicker cartilage. I don't know if you can fully appreciate this in this side, but on the top left is the healthy cartilage. The microfracture and some of the other treatments didn't work that well, but in the top right, uh, with our new scaffold, we were able to the, at least the best uh, um, out of all these groups at regrowing some of the uh, healthy cartilage. Uh, you can see it in these uh, as well. So, uh, final thoughts: these are uh, cartilage uh, lesions are very common. Um, variable clinical presentation. Uh, there's a lot of, it's more of an art treating these in the science. Uh, so we do whatever we can to give them symptomatic relief. But if we, if we have really identified that a certain cartilage defect is symptomatic, uh, there are, uh, there are some good treatment options. Uh, I would say good, but not great. So uh, we still, uh, all these uh, options that I mentioned tend to wear out with time, mainly because other than, other than the oats that I talked about, none of them are normal cartilage. Um, so uh, certainly I think uh, tissue engineering offers some really exciting uh, new opportunities. Uh, I'm continuing that line of research um, with Dr. Fisher. Um, I'm trying to use a 3D printed scaffold uh, that we can shape to that patient's specific uh, defect. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much. Sorry if I didn't leave enough time for questions, but I, I can certainly uh, answer some before one o'clock and I'm happy to stay here a little bit longer as well. Um, here at the University of Maryland, uh, we have, we've developed a, a huge center for sports medicine uh, with a multidisciplinary team, uh, not only a bunch of orthopedic surgeons, but non-operative sports medicine specialists as well, physiatrists, athletic trainers, uh, physical therapists. Uh, we're in all different locations. Uh, so we're, um, we're happy to work with you if you're for any of your, uh, ac any patient, not athlete or not. Uh, thank you very much.